Welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, episode 698. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 5th, 2021. Welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted, kind of frivolous Friday. We don't have a lot of the stories to talk about, so this episode will go really fast like all the other episodes we do, George. It'll be a lot of fun. Before we get too far into this episode and before it's over, before it began, please like this episode. That's that big thumb thing uh, you find on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, some people who are really popular podcasters, they say, smash the button. So please smash that button for uh, George and Kevin. Go and share this episode with friend and foe. Comment in the comment section. We got lots of great comments this week, and we really appreciate that. It's very encouraging. Um, we're almost, oh, just like one or two, maybe 15 away from 7,000 subscribers, which in Anglican terms, that makes us the mega podcast of all the Anglican world, George. And speaking of podcast, if you don't want to watch us, you can listen to us in audio only format. That link is found in the show notes on YouTube. George, um, you told me before I got to Florida, the rainy season is over. Come on down. It's dry. There's no humidity. It's 75 every day. Um, all I can tell you right now is we don't have any leaks in the RV. It's raining today, George. Well, you know, these things do happen. I'm not, I'm not uh, infallible. <laughs> we, we've got a front that's moving across the whole state, and it's going to rain all day, but it's, it's a beautiful day, Kevin. Uh, only in Florida, uh, I woke up this morning with the rain coming down, but only in Florida will the birds be singing and chirping while it's raining. No, it, it's it, just it, beautiful. It's interesting, but I'm, I'm trying to imagine, you know, when Noah checked the radar, uh, before he boarded the, the Ark. It probably looked a lot like it did over Florida right now. All yellow, orange, red, and green. You know, favorite colors. Well, uh, <clears throat> we uh, had a discussion about climate change in our last show, and I, in the comments I mentioned I wasn't particularly worried about climate change because my church is the highest Episcopal church in Florida. I don't mean by that angle Catholic. I mean we're about 150 feet oh, okay, above right. sea level. <laughs> Cool. So if we do have climate change and the waters rise, I will now have a beachfront church. So you I'm not really upset property. about it. <laughs> oh, my, yeah. my, my golf course view home will now be an oceanfront home because we're we're up here in the... You too, Kevin, will be now a uh, beachfront property. You're, yeah, I mean, we're probably, what, 50 miles, 40 miles from the coast over here? Yeah. You're on the Central Ridge so, uh, in Sumter County. Yeah, so which is cool. Nothing wrong with that. But if it really starts to flood, George, I just start the engine and drive north. You know? <laughs> <laughs> in that boat of yours, I think you could float north. Or, can, uh, yeah, yeah, there are floatable RVs, but I can't afford that. It's a different pattern of income. I'm looking here at the good news story, and uh, we didn't have one when, the, when we were doing our pre-show. George is like, well... This is kind of good news. And I'm like, what about this? Is this good news? He's like, well, no, that's not really good news. And you came up. Somebody had just sent you an email announcing an ad clericum from Bishop Martin Menz. I said, that is good news. We can talk about the ad clericum and talk about kind of the missing role of bishops that we find around the Anglican Communion or just the wider churches as well as the role of bishop has been lost it's it's become political it's become satirized it's become defunct for all for all intents and purposes so when we see bishops doing the right thing we want to promote that and here is a bishop putting to paper um what he wants his clergy to know and it's not critical race theory it's not the politics of the day it's not climate change it's actually something we find in scripture it's something we find in the history of the church and something that is notable about Christianity that you can't find anywhere else. Bishop Martin Minns writes in Ad Clericum on miracles. Well, it's not spelt that way, but... <laughs> well, 
Yes, I, 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 we got this uh, notice and I pulled up the web page and I thought Martin was talking about some French theological term. I'm going to read it to you. Ad clarum on Maricels. Maricels, yes. Maricels from Bishop Martin Menz. Now, us making fun of people for doing little gaffes like that is a bit the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah, uh, we, we do that all the time. King. I'm the king of typos, yes. But Kevin, you're absolutely right. We've Last week, we've published an ad clarum from the Archbishop of Cape Town about climate change. We've talked about Justin Welby's faux pas about uh, climate change, skeptics are Nazis. And so many bishops uh, across so many denominations, and we talked about how critical race theory and uh, liberation theology are now things for some bishops in the ACNA. And here we have a bishop who wrote an ad clarum that'll be good 50 years from now and it would have been good 50 years ago. This is a timeless statement on the place of miracles in the life of the Christian. And this is what I was talking about when I was saying, I want a bishop, I believe bishops should be held a teaching office and a pastoral office. And this is the sort of thing that, well, Martin does this well, but Martin I think is a standout compared to so many bishops in the world today of being able to provide sound theological doctrine and teaching that encourages, enlightens, and lifts up the people of God. Not talking about uh, mosquito nets or... Well, no, or, even, or even being on, on social media. I can think of all the Church of England bishops who are tweeting, they're on social media, causing disruption. Here mm-hmm. is an ACNA bishop supposed to be retired but he, you know, he keeps himself very busy uh, well he's the acting bishop of pittsburgh yep and so it, it's it's nice to see that i'm going to communicate to the clergy first of all and to the world and not do this in a, in a social media fashion where we're, we're tweeting and we're being controversial uh here we're being factual representative and re-identifying that role of bishop that we don't see anywhere else well, I'm also partial to the, the statement because Mar- Martin upholds the traditional understanding of miracles. Mm-hmm. We have a good number of, for instance, Jack Spong discounted miracles. Miracles don't exist. They were, there are explanations for what Christ did, and if, if not, then they were exaggerations. Mm-hmm. Miracles are untrue. Then we have some people on the extreme opposite spectrum from Jack Spong, who said the age of who said the age of miracles is past that was from the apostolic age we live in the post apostolic age and those gifts of the spirit were not given to us martin plows it down the middle uh, pro- uh, propounding what i would call traditional anglican teaching on miracles mm-hmm. uh, he doesn't seek to define them to describe them in ways that are dogmatic other than to realize that the workings of the Holy Spirit are a mystery in the life of the believer, yet God seems to continue to do these things again and again and again. I think the biggest contrast here we can draw with something like this in an ad clericum is Martin is not identifying his enemies to miracles (laughs) as Nazis. As I saw the Archbishop of Canterbury do, I've seen other recent ad clericums. If you don't believe this, you are no greater than blah. Well, that's the tenor of, of debate in the church today. If you don't agree with me, you're either evil or stupid. That holding a position, liberty of conscience is rapidly disappearing, and it's there's the requirement of conformity, which is you know the definition of wokeism. Uh, of requiring us all to use new new pronouns, new vocabulary, to use circumlocutions for uh, speech. Um, it's, well, you know what I think about that. It's just ridiculous. Well, okay. And, and if you get a chance and you see this story elsewhere on the Internet, please give a thumbs up. Uh, we do enjoy uh, Martin's writings. Let's move on to some other news. We have Dice of Al- Albany. We just... I'll give you a quick history because we've got lots of new viewers here. Uh, bishop Love was the Bishop of Albany for many years. He was slowly shown the door by the Episcopal Church after uh, some resolutions made at General Convention. Basically saying every diocese must be open to and allow 
churches that want to perform same-sex blessings and other things to do so and that kind of just showed the door for Bishop Love he decided to, to go uh, and retire and step down as Bishop of Albany Bishop of Albany just had a synod where these resolutions were going to be made into the bylaws it didn't make it the vote uh, and so they were not voted into the bylaws and we thought for sure that well that that's that's Albany now Albany is going to stand apart from the rest of the Episcopal Church and kind of be that place that that holds the line so to speak we got news this week that Albany is going to allow for depot uh, for those churches that do want to perform same-sex blessings and I, we got a new audience all the time George give me a quick definition of depot and what this means in Albany delegated Episcopal pastoral oversight mm -hmm. DEPO that uh, is a phrase in the Episcopal Church that sort of gained uh, usage in the 1990s when the Diocese of Pennsylvania allowed the forward and faith affiliated parishes, the Anglo Catholic parishes, to have Bishop Quincy at the time uh, come in and exercise Episcopal office. The Bishop of Pennsylvania, who was a liberal, allowed a conservative bishop to come in and act in his stead, confirm, counsel the clergy, so on and so forth. And every so often we have these spasms of depot where the church wants to agree to disagree and will allow theological minorities to have delegated Episcopal pastoral oversight. Well, that sort of died in the Jeffrey Shorey era where you had to it was either one way or the other. You couldn't basically uh, exercise the liberty of conscience. Well, no, I thought she just interpreted depot to mean deposition. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> completely different depot. <laughs> she, uh, well, she was what she was. And, uh, and, and now the lucky people of Los Angeles have her as an assisting bishop. That's just so wonderful. Well... The Standing Committee released a letter on November 1st of all from Albany mm -hmm. saying that we have agreed to allow those liberal progressive congregations in the diocese to seek depot to allow them to have same-sex blessings in their churches. They're essentially adopting the view of Central Florida and Dallas and uh, Tennessee some of the few remaining conservative dioceses, conservative clergy, conservative bishops, conservative congregations, who have said to their, in Central Florida, we have a single church, St. Richard's in Winter Park, that wishes to celebrate same-sex weddings. And the Bishop of Central Florida, Greg Brewer, has invited the Bishop of Kentucky to exercise depot over that parish in issues of marriage and whatnot. Now, now uh, St. Richard still pays its assessment to the diocese. Uh, its clergy are still members of the uh, convention. And Albany's standing committee has adopted that uh, approach. Um, I was a little surprised. So that's the facts. Now we'll talk about what that means and how did they get there. I'm a little surprised because the convention voted to kick this down, the can down the road and wait for the next bishop to decide. And something happened between the convention and Monday's letter to basically focus the standing committee's mind on, we better do this. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think from my very lax, inexperienced political mindset, if we allow depot for conservatives, do we allow depot for liberal churches? And they may have just said, listen, do we believe in depot or do we not believe in depot? Because depot has benefited the conservative church, the Orthodox Anglicans for going on two decades now. Can we be kind enough to allow the churches that are liberal depot as well? And so that may be the thought process here. Or, and I hate to say this because you and I know 815 very well, 
there was a threat of individual lawsuits to the stand, standing committee if they didn't do this. That's, I, we don't know that. I'm just, you know, we just know the history here of what could have been done. But yes, you know, pressure could have been placed on yeah. the standing committee. Absolutely. Or they could have been told that uh, you're uh, going to make, you know, you're, we're going to give you a lot of grief if for your next Episcopal election. Sure. Yeah. Or we're going to insist on uh, more money out of you. In other words, there are ways the national church can pressure uh, a diocese um, to, to go along. Right. So we, uh, no, the, so we it, don't know it, if that it, was the case. Well, no, but what you're saying is, you know, we will oppose whatever bishop you choose unless you go, you know, if you set this forward, we'll make getting your next bishop easier. We won't mark Lawrence you. Well, in a rational world and in a fair world, we do have depot going in both directions. The problem is, for instance, in the Diocese of Pennsylvania, Charles Benison was elected bishop in 93, 4. And I remember, because I was a seminarian at the time, and the bishop had the seminarians all come down to basically act as ushers and dogs' bodies at the convention and see how it operated. And I can remember standing with a group of clergy, sort of in a circle, sort of in the back. I wasn't one of them. I was hoping to be one of them. And Charles Benison, who was one of the candidates, was promising the Ford and Faith clergy that he would allow Depot to continue if they voted for him. And the other candidate was saying, well, you don't need Depot for me because I'm one of you, except I'm an evangelical. I'm not an Anglo-Catholic. And David Moyer, sort of the leader of the Ford and Faith crowd from Rosemont, made the basically said, okay, we'll vote for the liberal because he's promised us this. Soon as Benison was elected bishop, he reneged on his promise. And Depot was eliminated and thus began all the Pennsylvania, which was basically one of the first dioceses to fracture in a small way, not like Fort Worth or something where everybody went to have these problems. So the problem is Depot is only as good as the bishops involved. So if you're Greg Brewer and the Bishop of Kentucky and you're personally friends, you can work out stuff. Absolutely. That, you know, I'll do this. And you have They have a conservative parish in Kentucky that Greg Brewer looks after. And we have a liberal parish in Central Florida where all the Disney employees go that... Uh, the Kentucky can look after. I'm serious about that. <laughs> and and uh, it, if, but if the bishops, but here's the thing, um, the, these rules are only as good as the worst person in the room. And the Episcopal Church has been plagued by benisons, uh, bad well, bishops really? who won't play ball, who <laughs> have this Messiah complex that you have to all be like me or you know the Catherine Jeffrey Shorey syndrome yeah I mean I don't want to get sued but Charles Benison was Charles Benison um, if you want to know about Charles Benison I'm going to provide a link to his Wikipedia page on the show notes here and for a bishop who served in the Episcopal Church he has a very long Wikipedia page it includes all the controversies and all the broken promises and the, the sexual misconduct cover-ups and the Good Shepherd Church. Uh, well, you know. we should say that he yeah. was con he was convicted of covering up sexual misconduct and abuse, but on appeal it was overturned because the statute of limitations. Right. So. And uh, I, I just you know, here's Kevin's day. We get you know. We get donations for Anglican TV Ministries. Thank you. But every time I get a letter, and the letterhead is from a lawyer, I, I, I get little beads of sweat before I open up the letter. <laughs> and thankfully, they're all donations. But you got to think, oh, here we go. The Episcopal Church is coming down on Kevin, or somebody's not happy with, somebody's going to try and, you know, get us with libel and slander. And, uh... Well, just... 
So. Charles Bennison was famous on so many levels. He was the one who sent out an Easter message one year where he told the Diocese of Pennsylvania that Jesus was a sinner just like you and me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and that some may, some of those well-versed in Episcopal lore may remember the time that Charles Bennison went to Church of the Good Samaritan in Paoli, Pennsylvania and was preaching and a man rose in the middle of his sermon and said, you, sir, are a heretic. Sounds like a conquer. <laughs> it's my father. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and I was in seminary, so it was and not the wisest thing to do. Uh, <laughs> and Benison got his revenge. And I, and I only, a serious, true story, I was ordained where Benison and Bob Duncan did a swap. Bob Duncan came to Philadelphia diocese to ordain me and Charles Benison went out to Pittsburgh to ordain somebody from Calvary at Pittsburgh, Harold Lewis's liberal church. Really? Wow. was one of the liberal. So sure. that was, that was before, before that was, uh, in the early days. So I was, uh, I was count ordained a priest under depot. Um, but then, so Friends, I'm not particularly worried about being sued because you can't be sued for stating facts. No, you can't. Well, you can be threatened, but you can't be sued. Well, I'm judgment proof, yeah. Kevin. I'm not a millionaire like you. Uh, I, well, you, you, I, that's why you don't tell people where your uh, monster of the van is because you've got your gold bars stacked uh, inside the walls as insulation. That would explain the poor gas mileage. And so, uh, enough talk about bishops. No, guess not. Guess who else is in the news? Uh, more on Bishop uh, Michael Nazarali. Uh, we have a new statement today from Archbishop Foley and uh, um, Archbishop Ben Quasi on uh, their feelings towards what happened with uh, Bishop Michael Nazarali going to the Roman Catholic Church. What do they say and where can they find that statement, George? We can look on Anglican Inc. You can yeah. see the statement. This is a reaction to the reaction. When Michael Nazarelli left, uh, joined the Roman Catholic Church, Foley Beach wrote a very kind letter, I'm sorry to see you go, as did other leaders of GAFCON. But the Church of Nigeria wrote a very strong letter uh, saying that, uh, uh, well, this, that he's abandoning the true faith and uh, we're quite harsh about Michael Nazarelli. And so Gafcon, under the pen of uh, Ben Kwashi and, and Foley Beach, this morning, the 5th of November, released a letter saying, and I'll quote from it, some rightful expression, expressions of respect for him as a person have been misinterpreted and have raised questions about the integrity of Gafcon. But then they goes on to say, having had discussions with our leadership in different parts of the world, we feel led to write to you to encourage you and reassure you of the continued firm theological stand of GAFCON. What does this mean? Well, S Sydney had a very strong letter. The Irish had a strong letter. Nigerians had a very strong letter. And I think the respect for Michael, Michael Nazarelli as a person uh, was misinterpreted to mean that it was okay to leave and become a Roman Catholic. And so the letter then goes on to lay out the distinctiveness of the Anglican way and why this is the best way mm -hmm. and it's the biblical way. So we like Michael Nazarelli as a guy, but he made a really bad decision, is what this letter is saying, so that there are no doubts as to where Gafcon stands on the... Uh, institution of the Roman Catholic Church it's one of those difficult uh, things you, you have somebody who some Anglicans would say he's left the faith you know uh, some would say you know now we have at best an ecumenical relationship with uh, uh, Michael Nazarelli who's now a priest within the Roman Catholic Church is he a deacon or a priest he became a Catholic uh, mm -hmm. at the end of October mm-hmm was ordained a deacon last Wednesday mm -hmm. and a priest last Saturday. That's quick. But maybe, maybe that story will transpire in the future. But so 
in this difficult situation, what do you do? You, 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 you don't want to state the over obvious, but you want to be kind in this. And I think both uh, Ben Quashi and uh, Foley Beach do that in, in trying to lay out what does this mean? Can can I as an Anglican just jump over to the Roman Catholic Church? No, it's it's not the same. And here's why it's not the same. You know, there is a difference in our doctrine and this is why it's important and this is why you need to understand why it's important. So, good job. Well, let's go here to the show notes. Oh boy, that's it. That, we're out of stories. Good, all done. Except that. Kevin's favorite political topic came up this week, and it's called the the political pendulum. Uh, I've talked before, and I want to represent to my audience who are on both sides, uh, liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat, Tory or you know, you know. okay, everybody has their side in, in politics. And so when George and I are talking about this, we're trying to talk to this in a way that represents our whole audience. And I've told you before that um, I believe there's a pendulum in politics that, you know, it never always goes far to the right and stays there. It's kind of, you know, it, politics gets there and then it slowly comes back and goes left again and then goes right again. Or some will say right is red and blue and blue is red. George, when we say red here in America, we mean Republican. When you say red over in, in Europe, it's a different uh, color scheme they got going yeah. on there. It's the communists or the <laughs> left. <laughs> so here in America, we had our first election since uh, Joe Biden was uh, elected president uh, one year and one day ago. And it's interesting to see that once again, the pendulum, which was going, this is your stage left, uh, stage right, was uh, certainly going to be liberal and it was going to be ultra liberal and the people that he was picking to lead his administration were even more left than Joe was. And I, in my political expertise, yeah, right, have said that it'll never stay that way. The pendulum always comes back. And we saw that with this election in Virginia and New Jersey and Texas, where the basic populace says, we just wanted to get rid of the old guy. We didn't like Joe at all. And we certainly didn't like his policies. And so they're, they're, they're always trying to find this pendulum middle ground. And I thought we'd talk about this more because there's an Anglican influence from what I can read in the life of the uh, new governor of Virginia. Uh, Youngkin, Governor Youngkin, Governor-elect Youngkin, Glenn yeah. Youngkin, uh, was attacked uh, in press by Diana Butler Bass, mm -hmm. who's a talking head that you'll see on public television and the various uh, channels, the M MSNBC, CNN, She's a religious scholar who comments on religion and culture. She's an Episcopalian. And she attacked Yunkin for being an Anglican, but not being an Episcopalian. Yunkin attends a unaffiliated Anglican church. Uh, he at one time was a Christian at Holy Trinity, Brom Holy Trinity Brompton. And when he came back to the United States, essentially they formed an alpha group that grew into a church. And they have uh, an Anglican ethos, but they're not affiliated with the Episcopal Church or with the Anglican Church in North America. And Diana Butler Bass really ripped into Youngkin for being a stealth, homophobe, misogynist, schismatic, heretic for not pledging allegiance to the Episcopal Church of the USA. And Youngkin. Uh, it didn't seem to harm him one tiny bit. Oh. Uh, the uh, what is fascinating, I think, with Yunkin, is I think your the, your pendulum theory, I think, is is sound. But what I saw, what I think we saw, is more the Bill Clinton phenomena yeah. uh, at work, where Yunkin was able to seize the middle ground. Uh, let's take southwestern Virginia, where uh, Donald Trump won seventy five, eighty percent of the vote when he ran against Joe Biden. Youngkin kept all of those votes, but pushed it up to 85% margin. 
a five per ten percent swing and those people were those conservatives who may have supported Trump's policies but didn't like the man or independents who again supported the policies but didn't like the person and Yunkin won because he was able to keep the Trump base and by adopting if you will Trump policies but the demeanor and sort of kindly persona of Mike Pence was able to put together a coalition that beat the Democrat. And you saw something similar in New Jersey. And you saw, uh, let's take the city of Buffalo, New York. The Democratic primary, a socialist, ousted the uh, incumbent in the Democratic primary. The hard left won the primary. Well, the, the incumbent ran as an independent as a writing candidate and was elected as re-elected mayor over the Democratic Party nominated candidate. City of Seattle for the city attorney's position had a uh, the Democratic nominee was a woman who believed in Black Lives Matter uh, Occupy. I mean, she just was really out there. Uh, property is theft. She was about Marxist socialist. And Seattle now has a Republican city attorney since who knows when, who is not a Trump clone by any means, but sees the middle. So I think you we were when we were talking before, you talked about how Bill Clinton was so famous for doing this. Well, Bill Clinton came to office as the new generation, the, the, that Pepsi, the new Pepsi uh, type person uh, defeating a, I think, George... Walker Bush wanted to run for a second term and lost to uh, uh, to Bill and uh, Al Gore. And initially, what happened? What happens is you think you were elected because they want every policy you ever believed in uh, to pass into law in America, and that's not true. Many times they just want to get rid of the old guy, and they want a little bit of new. America has always kind of been on this little. America is a small pendulum. Uh, it, when you get to the, the presidential politics, it becomes this big pendulum. And if a, if a president learns to, to stay within this, this five degrees of pendulum, they do really well. And so Bill Clinton learned really quick, uh, right after he was elected, two years later, uh, there was a congressional Senate House election, and he lost like no president in history has lost before. Majority uh, Democrat ruled Senate for 40 years. Uh, now had Newt Gingrich in charge and there's a contract with America and that's all because um, that pendulum didn't want to go as far as Dem uh, Democrat Bill Clinton wanted to take it and his administration wanted to take it and all of a sudden we're back here to that little five degree middle and Bill Clinton in his genius said I heard the American people that election last night where I was slaughtered in the House and the Senate I, I understand and I hear and I'm going to be a moderate Democratic president and uh, my first challenge is welfare reform. Bill Clinton uh, passed the largest welfare reform package in the history of America. Um, he pretty much almost balanced the budget as, as close as a president could come to it. And he, he voted against gay marriage. Yeah, I mean, he did. He he became a, a centrist president, a populist president without Twitter, um, and became a loved president. Even he survived Monica Lewinsky because he was a populist president, uh, and he knew how to speak to the populace. He knew how to communicate um, a liberal idea and make it sound like a conservative idea. That was Bill Clinton's magic current politicians in the last 20 years 15 years don't have that magic and i think we that's why it's so hard to watch the news it's so hard to pay close attention to the social networking because everybody's enemy now is a nazi everybody's okay. enemy now is a racist everybody's enemy now is somebody who is going to destroy america and that's hard to watch on the news george that's not a a unifying issue so it's nice to see some candidates being elected who want to unify. I think what I'm, I'm bubbling over, and I don't know how to say it, I don't know how to put it into words, but I think in addition to this natural pendulum swing that we see, 
I think we're reaching a tipping point of some sort mm -hmm. where the white working class men in this country just no longer have respect for the institutions they're no longer their government their judiciary their Episcopal Church now it's even reached into the military where wokeism and uh, political correctness rather than defense of the nation is primary I saw a news article that was only in the British press the Daily Mail as well as in the Military Times and specialty publications and the shock of it is so traumatic for some people that there were games out in the Mojave Desert and they were between US Marine Corps and the British and the Dutch Royal Marines and it was supposed to be two weeks of maneuvers and war games and simulated combat the US Marines were whipped and had to surrender after five days and start over and the post mortem shows that the Marines mixed gender rifle companies are so woefully bad compared to their uh, past that the British Marines and the Dutch Marines were able to run rings around them because the primary emphasis of the command has not been military proficiency or getting the best out of our troops but of social engineering that's just one little anecdote but I do see a peasant's revolt forming. Uh, Donald Trump may have been that first manifestation of it, but maybe this race in New Jersey where a truck driver is, uh, is expected to beat the state Senate president and the truck in, in the local election for the Senate seat. And this truck driver only spent 150 some odd dollars on his campaign, and half of that was for donuts for the volunteers. So that the politicians are being thrown out and in protest. Now, this may also be part of the pendulum, but I do think that there's such a disconnect between the elites, media, courts, government, church, uh, army, universities, that uh, people are just uh, sick and tired and fed up. Yeah, I mean, we have become really divided by our politics, and we've become an, it's just severely a two political party system. Um, and like I said before, we make our enemies Nazis or racist. And the conservatives are guilty of this, and the and the liberals are guilty of this. And you know, I don't. It's disappointing to watch. Part of the problem, obviously, is the internet and social media, and the, the only news you can get is from pundits like us, you know, because people don't have time now to read the news and ingest the news. You have to hear it from people like George and I who read the news and ingest the news. So it, it is what it is. Pray for our nation. Pray for our world. Uh, you know, pray that we can, you know, become unified again. Uh, but always understand that there's a pendulum in politics and. Uh, America really holds that that five to, to six degrees, not that 60 to, to 70 degree pendulum that politicians wish we did. So, hey, that's today's show of Anglican Unscripted. I don't see any other stories out there. We'll save Indian corruption for some other time, of course. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 698 of Anglican Unscripted.